Let's open our Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I've been so busy since I came back from holidays with getting things back and getting ready for September. I haven't had a chance to listen to Pastor Jacques' message yet, so hopefully it follows where you were going. Uh, I mean, <laughs> which, you know, in, but the Holy Ghost knows how to do that, doesn't he? He's able to pull things together. So, Father, I thank you that as I share the word today, Lord, that you would receive glory and that you would just speak to us in a fresh way today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, Hebrews chapter 11, 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible. Say impossible. To please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God wants to reward us if we'll diligently seek him. That's the heart of God. Amen? He wants to, he wants to reward us. He's a, God, he's a God that wants to pour favor upon us. He wants us to be blessed. We're co-heirs with Christ. He has, he has lavished whatever Jesus is, whatever the Father has given me, I, I give it to you. See, God wants us to be a blessed people. Say he, a blessed people. Okay, and, 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 and I love reading through Hebrews chapter 11 because Hebrew chap, chapter 11 is really, um, it, it's the, you know how you have the Hockey Hall of Fame, you know? You ever go to the Hockey Hall of Fame, you hear all these hockey players. It doesn't talk about everything the hockey players did throughout their whole career, but what it does is highlights the, f the things that made them famous. Amen? And Hebrews chapter 11 is like that. That's, that's the, uh, the, the, the faith, the, the, it's the Hall of Faith. And, and so it really points out the things that made that the, the, the great accomplishment of men and women in the walk of faith. And so when I read through this here, um, I begin to see all these highlights. And the Bible says that starting in, I think it's verse, starting in the, I think it's verse 3 here. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that all things were, that are seen were not made of things which are visible. So God starts out talking about his faith. I think that's pretty awesome, right? That, that, that God was able to create a world out of things that are not seen. It's, he took things that were invisible and he created what is visible. And we, we, we realize in the 1600s, 1700s, there was a, a Dutch draper by the name of Vanton, and he was uh, the pioneer of the microscope. And in the late 17th century, they began to see all these, these little things they could never see before and they're saying wow things are made of things unseen and the word of God came to pass it was revealed amen and I think that's pretty awesome God that's a pretty good accomplishment and then we read about Abel's faith and Enoch oh Enoch was the first guy who was was transported he he was teleported to heaven I think that's pretty cool that's that's pretty awesome faith you know yeah, you know, uh, what did you do uh, on the earth? Well, let me tell you, I believe God so much that God just transported me. Everyone's like, yay, that's pretty awesome, right? Hurrah. And, and I think that's pretty awesome. And, and then Abraham moved from home. He moved away from home without a destination. He said, well, God's speaking to me, and he just went. And so we look at these things, and we say, these guys were men of faith. And, and, and it's, it's very impressive. And then Sarah gave birth to her first child at the age of 90. She just said, you know what, I'm just going to believe God because he said it, and then she had a baby. I mean, that's impressive faith. Wouldn't you say so? Yes. Moses led a nation out of Egypt. Moses split the sea. Joshua believed God, and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. These are awesome accomplishments of faith. Would you agree? But as we're reading through, right dead center in the middle of the chapter, in verse 20, I want to read that. I want to focus on that this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. So Jacob and Esau were the sons of Isaac, and it says, By faith, Isaac laid his hands and blessed them concerning things to come. When I read that, I thought, wow. Isaac did more awesome things than that. Why, why? See, the things that are important to God might not be important to us. The things that are important to us might not be that important to God. But to God, God looked at that and said, that was the greatest accomplishment that Isaac did because he was able to lay his hands on his two kids and he was able to bless them concerning the things that were coming after he died. Let's read the next verse. So this is Isaac. 
Isaac lays his hands on Jacob and Esau, and he prophesies the word of the Lord. This is going to happen in your generation. God is going to bless you. The kingdom of God is going to advance through you. I'm going to heaven, basically, but you're going to continue what God started. The next verse says this, verse 21. Now Jacob, by faith, when he was dying, he blessed each of his sons, the sons of Joseph, and he worshipped leaning on the top of his staff. Wow. He's laying, huns, he's laying hands on his two sons, his grandsons, and blessing them and speaking the word of the Lord moving forward. And that's pretty, pretty amazing. Now, I want you to understand, the reason why this ended up in the hall of faith is because to God, uh, the kingdom is generational. There's a generational blessing. And when God looks from heaven, when heaven looks from the balconies of heaven, they look and they see a generational kingdom that's growing and being passed on from generation to generation to generation to generation. And if you're not careful, the enemy wants you to get so focused on yourself and what you can get from God that you're not pouring into the next generation. And what happens is the kingdom stops in your generation. There's no residual income, you see. You say, but I want to see the blessings of God in my lifetime. You will, because you have eternal life. And there's something about standing from the balcony of heaven and saying, okay, look, I poured into this next generation. Look at them go. Look, I, I imparted. The kingdom is advancing. God's bigger picture will be accomplished. But if we get focused on what can I get out of God? What can I get out of, what can I get out of the kingdom of God? And our focus isn't about advancing the next generation. Residual income gets cut off. Back in the 50s, you know, there was guys that started these burger joints. And uh, they made some money and they were famous. And I, could, I could name a few of them. But they don't exist today. But a man by the name of Ray Kroc who bought a, a restaurant franchise off of the McDonald Brothers, uh, he took that industry. And how many know he's dead now? But he's making more money today than he did when he died or when he bought the restaurant. Why? Because he created a residual, it was a kingdom of residual income that was, in, it was the same way in the spirit. We gotta be looking at the next generation. We gotta be pouring into the next generation because God honors that and God thinks that's pretty good. So the kingdom is, the greatest faith is not acts of signs and wonders, but the greatest act of faith is passing the baton to the next generation in the eyes of God. You know, I was just at life camp. We took our holidays and we went camping. We spent four days at a Christian camp. Pastor John Finocchio, some of you know him. And I was watching as everyone leading the services, a lot of them were in their 20s and just on fire and passionate. And you know what John said to me? He said, you know what? He said, we made a decision 10 years ago. We're going to pour into the youth. We're, we're going we're gonna to get it. We're going to make sure they experience the Holy Ghost. We're going we're gonna to make sure that they experience the fire of God. We're going to invest. We're going to pour in until they're all on fire for God. We're going to pour into the kids' ministry. And he said, Travis, he says, four or five years comes fast. He says, you have 10-year-olds in your church. They need to be learning worship. They need to get passionate about God. You need to pour into that generation because five years from now, they're going to be leading the church. But if you're so busy focusing on yourself and not focusing on raising up the next generation, we're missing the mark. Amen? I had this conversation where my son and my daughter came and said, when can we be on the worship team? I want to take drum lessons. My little Jonas likes to play drums. Right? We got Jonah here. He's, he's like ready to be a worship leader now. Why? Because he was here and, and he's been trained and he's been equipped, you see. And, and this is the place that God wants us to be raising up the next generation so that this kingdom progresses and it moves forward into the next generation, to the next generation. We should be thinking about our grandkids, grandkids, if the Lord tarries. Amen? So we need to determine to pour into our children. I don't have kids, spiritual children. Pour in at home, at church, and what will this church look like in five years? We had, we had um, uh, Charlie Sweet, I don't, Charlie Sweet and Gary Hayes both prophesied that this, there's gonna be a great move of God in the kids' ministry. There's gonna be a great move of God in the youth. 
And if we begin to think like five years out, just five years, think about it. We have 10-year-olds, preteens. We have, you know, 13-year-olds, 9-year-olds. In five years, can be up here. They can be preaching the gospel. They can, they can be, you know, they can be doing stuff in the kingdom of God. We need to pour in now. We need to think generationally. If we don't think generationally, we miss the mark. Amen? So this morning, I just wanted to talk a little bit about generational blessings. Go with me to Genesis chapter 26, beginning of the Bible. We're going to start in verse 1. How many are there? You can all say yes because we have it up. It says, um, there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. All right. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. And the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Okay. Dwell in this land and I will be with you. This is verse 3. And bless you for you and your descendants. I will give all the lands... And I will perform the oath. Say the oath. Not, it's the oath. This is the big one, okay? I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And it tells us about this in verse 4. He says to Isaac, And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heaven. I will give your descendants all the land and your seed. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in your seed. See, we don't think today about our seed. We think about us. Amen? And you know what? We, it's all like we hear these prophecies about revival coming to Trenton, right? How many have heard that, you know, the tsunami wave? Well, you know what? I really hope it comes in my generation, but it might not. Maybe my kids will experience that. But I'm part of the process of preparation for God's move. And if I, if I miss that mark, if I don't do what I have to do in order to pour into the next generation, revival might not come. And so there's a generational thing going on. And we see that God put a generational blessing on Abraham. It was going to go to Isaac, which was going to go to Jacob. It was going to pass down to today. And here's the blessing. I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heavens. I will give your descendants all the land and your seed and the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Verse 5. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge my commandments and my laws. I want to say this, that if you're obedient to God, if you obey the command of the Lord, guess what? You're going to be blessed. Right? And so the blessing came because of Abraham's obedience. All right? So there's a generational blessing. Say generational blessing. We just read about it. So Isaac has a generational blessing. Can you say that with me? Isaac has a generational blessing. But as we read on, it's just kind of this thing. My eyes opened up and I saw that he also had a generational curse that he didn't deal with. And I want to read that to you here. We're going to start in verse 6. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of that place asked about his wife. And he said, she's my sister. You know, you, you, you know, Isaac's no Braveheart. You know, he's not like, this is my woman. He's, oh, no, she's my sister. And I'm sitting there going, here's a man who's blessed by God, and he's, 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 uh, he's submitting to a spirit of fear, and therefore now there's a lying spirit coming out of him. You see this here. We'll read it together. The man of the place asked about his wife. This is verse 7. And he said, she's my sister, for he was afraid to say she is my wife because he thought lest the men of this place kill me for Rebecca because she's so beautiful to behold verse 8 now it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech king of the Philistines looked through a window and he saw and there was Isaac cuddling with his wife and he said oh, 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 hold on a second I thought she was your sister you're a little close for that and look what he says in the next verse here then Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously, she's, she's your wife, man. You know, like, how can you say she's your sister? And Isaac said to him, because, uh, because I don't want to die on her account of her. 
I don't want to die because of her. So he wasn't a brave heart. He, I mean, he had some issues. He had a spirit of fear, which caused him to lie. So I want to say that because you can have the blessing of God, and you do. We have the blessing of God. But how many know we got our stuff? All right? And, and this was something that Abraham never dealt with, and so it passed on to, it passed on to his son. And if you don't believe me, we'll, we'll look at that in just a few minutes. So what happened in verse 11, so Abimelech charged all the people saying, he who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Okay? So in other words, Abimelech saw, hey, the blessing of God is on this man. The, the favor of God. This is a man of God. But in his, he, so everyone saw that this guy was blessed, but he still had a spirit of fear. And if we go back to, um, let me just put my page here. Let's go back to Genesis uh, chapter 12. Is it okay we do a bit of Bible study here? Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> and um, I don't know what I have in this. Okay, verse 10. This is Abraham. Now we're going years. We're going back in the future. We're going back in the past. Now we're going back to, to Abraham, okay? This is the father of Isaac, okay? Now there was a famine in the land. A and you see what? Here's the thing. I want you to get this. The weakness in Isaac came to the service when there was a famine in the land, when things weren't going well, when, you know, sometimes we get a place in our lives where we don't feel the presence of God or we just feel like the promises of God aren't there. I, I don't think I'm going to make it. And you feel like there's a spiritual famine. That's when these generational curses start to rise up. And we saw it. There was a famine in the land. Isaac began to submit to a spirit of fear. We go back in the past. We see Abraham. Now it was there was a famine in the land. And Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. Verse 11, and it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. So, honey, like, I don't want to die on account of you. So instead of protecting Sarai and saying, I'm standing up for her, I'm, you know, I'm the man of the house, he kind of hid and said, let's, let's lie. You see a pattern here? Verse 13, please, Sarah, if you don't mind, um, please say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake and that I, uh, I may live because of you. Verse 14, so it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was beautiful. The princes of the Pharaoh also saw and commended her to Pharaoh. She was not, she was drop dead gorgeous, apparently. They, everyone saw her walk by, you know, and, and he, he treated Abraham well for her sake. And he came to Abraham, he said, can I have your, is, it, is, this, is this your wife? No, she's my sister. Well, I'll tell you what, Abraham, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of sheep and goats and some gold and silver, and can I have your sister? And Abraham's like, okay. Like, it's amazing because we, th we read about the, the patriarchs, and we read about them, we think they're great. I could never measure up to who they were. They were fallen men and women just like we are. They had their stuff. And that gives me great confidence that, listen, God can use me even if I have my stuff. And so it, this, is, this is amazing. And... Uh, so he treated Abraham well for her sake. And then let's look what happened here in verse 17. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And Pharaoh called to Abraham and said, what is this you've done to me? What is wrong with you? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? I might have taken her as my wife, and, and, and uh, then God would have came and judged me, and he would have destroyed. Like, people saw the favor of God on, the, on these leaders, but they allowed a generational sin of fear and lying. And you know what amazes me is that um, verse 20 says, So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, Abraham with his wife and all that he had, and then Genesis 13, verse 2 says, Abram was very rich with livestock and with silver and gold. See, God blessed Abraham. Abraham was ble the blessing of God was all over him. 
And what amazes me is that I can see Abraham sitting with Isaac and say, you know what? There was a day, there was a time when we were camped outside of Egypt and we went into Egypt and I was afraid because I thought that they were going to take your mother away from me. So I pretend she was my sister and, you know, and all this. But you know what? God came through in the very end and, and the, the, the king was afraid and he blessed us and he released us. And, and, but so I'm sure Isaac heard those stories. I'm assuming he probably heard those stories because Abraham's trying to build faith in the next generation. And then Isaac go and does the same thing in the midst of a famine. And how many of you say, you know what, my mom and dad used to do that, and I'll never do what they do. And then you catch yourself saying something stupid. You're like, I just, I just became my dad or my mom. No offense, mom or dad. So. But you know what I'm saying? It's a generational thing. And you know what? I'm sharing this because in the next six months or so, we're really going to focus on dealing with our stuff. So revival can come. And so, you know, you can enjoy the blessings of God and walk in victory, but God wants you to deal with your stuff. Amen? So, where were we? So anyway, um, there was a famine in the land. I totally left my notes. Um, But let's go to Genesis chapter 26. We're going to flip back to Isaac for a second. Let's go back to Isaac. Okay, so we went back in the past. We looked at his father's issues. And we're coming back to Isaac here. And it says in Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. Okay. Are we there? Okay. And then Isaac sowed in that land, and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. Now, I want you to understand something. There's a famine in the land. Everybody else is sowing and not getting a harvest. They're putting their seed in the ground. The seed dies. This guy, because of the blessing of his father Abraham, he puts seed in the ground and hundredfold comes out of the ground. Isn't that awesome? Because God will bless you even in the midst of famine. Even when everybody else says, you know what? There's nothing going on. God's not moving. The church is dead. There's no revival. You can live in the midst of a revival that everything you sow, everything you plant, God's going to bring forth harvest. Why? Because you're connected with God. And so here, here he is. He's got the blessing of his father upon him. And he's sowing in the land. He's reaping a hundredfold. Verse 13. And I love verse 13. The man began to prosper, continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Here, here, here we got a guy, you, you use the word prosper three times in one, one verse. The guy was wealthy, he was rich. There's nothing wrong with having things. You know, I know people, I know guys who are rich, lots of money, dripping with money. They're the biggest givers I know. They'll walk into a church and say, what are the needs? Oh, you need a new roof? Here's 50 grand. Big giver. So it's not, having money is not a bad thing. It's having a heart that's willing to give when the Lord says give. So he's very prosperous. And so what happened was the Philistines envied him. The Philistines represent, if you take types and shadows, they represent the, the enemy of our soul, the devil. The world of dark underlords. Demonics. Demons, you know. That are, and that's a real, that's a real... That's a real place. And uh, the Philistines envied him. You know, the enemy envies you because you're a child of God. You're walking in the blessing of God. The devil once was Lucifer. He was in heaven. He, he was adorned with every precious jewel. He was, he was, a, he was a prince with, with God. He, he was an amazing creature of beauty, and he lost it. He's in a fallen state. But now you and I have that anointing that covers us instead of him. And he's envious of that. The enemy's envious that we're going to walk into our destiny and doesn't want us to do that. All right? And so Abimelech says, go away from us, for you're more mighty than I. So let's look at verse 15. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. And so what I'd like you to do, Bill, is Bill here? Where's the bill? Can you bring me those things over there? I'm going to get you to help me. The Philistines were angry. And in those days, what they did, and they do it to this day in some countries, 
is if you want to drive someone out of the land, right, you, you will poison the well, you will fill in the well, because how many know that water is the source of life? If you can clog up the wells, you'll stop the, 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 the life to come so you can't give water to your herds, you can't water your gardens. I mean, it's not a good thing. And so the Philistines were envious, and they said, listen, we cannot stop the blessing of God in this man's life, but what we'll do is we'll stop the river from flowing from the wells. And so this represents the well. You want to hold that, brother? So the first thing that they did was the Philistines took some rocks and they filled the well here. And they dumped rocks in the well. And these rocks, you can just stay here, brother. These rocks actually represent pride. And if we're not careful, we can get to a place in our life where our heart can become hard towards the things of God. We begin to think, you know what, I can do this on my own strength. You know, I, I just, I'm just going to go through life and, you know, I'm just going to focus on, you know, accomplishing things on my own. How many know that you cannot do it in your own strength? And if you allow pride into your life, it, it's going to start to clog the well of your life. The Bible says out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. And so these stones, these are the stones of pride and bitterness, and they, they get into your heart. And, and as you can see, the water is still clear. You have pride in your life, and you can a, a, and not deal with it. And God's, you can pray for people. You can still minister to people, and, the, and the, the life is still clear. God is still working. This is in your heart. But what happens is after a while, the enemy says, I've got to put something else in here. I'm going to come and put sticks. I'm going to clog the well. Here, let's put some sticks in there. All right. Now, sticks can actually represent the cares of this world. When you begin to get self-focused, you begin to think about the fact that you can do life on your own. You can handle every situation by yourself. You get caught up in the cares of this world. You start measuring yourself with the Joneses, and I have to have this, and I have to do that, and i got to accomplish this. And, and those sticks represent the cares of this world. And they were poured into the well. The third thing that was put in the well, and I want you to notice here too, is that this water here is still clear. There's still life. You get around people that have pride in their life, you get around people that, um, that are just, it's all about money and it's about what they can attain and everything else, and uh, there's the anointing's still flowing, there's still some life, you know, because God, the, the river's flowing. But the next one here is dirt. And this is poured into the water. Can you stir that around for me, brother? And what will happen with the dirt? The dirt is actually gossip and slander. And if you allow pride in and you allow the cares of this world and you start measuring yourself by yourself and you start, well, did you see what so-and-so did? And this person in the church and, you know, blah, blah. And you start talking and all of a sudden the waters get defiled. The Bible says in James chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, let's read it together. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? And people are defiled. Now nobody can drink from the well anymore because it's not the, the clear well of God's presence. Now it's defiled. And then the last thing that the Philistines put in the well was carcasses. I don't have any here. I didn't have chicken lately for lunch. I would have a little carcass bone, and we'd stick it in there. Now, now the thing with the carcass, as you know, this represents the old dead man and his deeds. And if you don't deal with the rocks, if you don't deal with uh, the, the, the stones of pride, if you don't deal with this desire to just care about the things of this world, if you don't deal with gossip and slander in your life, the next thing you know, you'll start acting the way you act before you met the Lord. You start talking the way. You start responding the way. And it's like your old dead man that was buried in baptism is in your well. And now when people, you speak into people's life and you minister to people's life, guess what happens? They get poisoned and they get full of disease. And that's what happens. And on a level of revival, on a, on a local church level, God pours out revival and it's a, there's a well that's been dug. And the waters begin to spring, 
And the enemy says, I can't stop the blessing. So he starts working on people so that they'll get pride in their life and they'll get, you know, bitterness in their life. And, and he begins to clog up the well. And then revival stops. Amen? And the amazing thing, and if you read on in this passage, you'll see that the Bible says that Isaac redug the wells that his father dug. He didn't have to dig the wells. He just had to redig the wells that were filled in. And God is calling us as a church. The Bible says, guard your heart, guard the wells, for out of it flows the issues of your life. Our heart is a well, and we have to guard it. Don't let the enemy put in your heart those things that are going to keep the fresh water of God's life to flow to the next generation. And so he redug the wells that his father dug. We need to be well diggers, right? You know, you can, you can pray, God send revival, God send revival, God send revival. And you can pray, and people have been doing it for years, and revival hasn't come. Because our prayers have not, can't just be God send revival, it has to be God search me, see if there be any evil way in me, Lord. What is it that has to be repented of? What do we need to deal with in order to let the fresh waters flow? Revival has already come, guys, 2,000 years ago. The Spirit of God was poured out on the day of Pentecost, and it's never left. But the wells have been buried. And the reason why I'm sharing this is that, you know, Charlie Sweet came, and he preached that there's, he had a prophetic vision of a well of salvation in our parking lot. How many remember that? There's a well, he said, there's a well of discipleship. And so as I was studying this, and I talked to Charlie, I saw him a few days ago, and, and I said, listen, you prophesied about these wells. And I said, we need to redig them because they're here, and we need to get the water flowing in the wells. And I want to say this here, just like Isaac redug a well that his ancestor had dug, I want you guys to know, and some of you know this, that there was a church called the Old Hay Bay Church, it's the oldest surviving Methodist building um, in Canada. It was erected in 1792 by the set settlers that were coming over here, including the United Empire Loyalists, who had recently arrived and established the community of Adolphus Town in modern-day Greater Napanee. Now, I don't know if you guys know about this, but um, there were saddlebag preachers who would come in and they would preach under the unction of the Holy Ghost, and great revivals happened. This is out by, um, if you go over to where the ferry goes across from Picton, Old Hay Bay Church, Methodist Revival. The first, that's where the gospel came to Canada. That's where revival started. Less than an hour from here, the gospel was preached. So people were coming from all over the place to get born again and saved in this little church called Old Hay Bay Church. And I'm here to say, listen, God wants us to redig the wells of our ancestors and say, listen, you know, we have to build on the promises of the past. We have to continue what they started. And it, it means we have to look and say, what was it that caused that thing to stop? Let's come before God, repent, and let's redig those wells. Amen? This is why as we're moving forward in September and October, why we're focusing on things like the Encounter Weekends, the, the Purple Book Discipleship course. We're going to be doing a healing, healing the Hearts course, and Pastor Jacques and Sharon are working with different people who, who want to work on their marriages and stuff. Why? Because we want to deal with those things that the enemy has put in our wells so that we can live in abundance. Amen. And let the river flow. Amen. So I want to encourage you guys, each and every one of us here, that we have to personally be willing to say, listen, we're going to guard the well. And when this stuff is in here, we're going to say, God, show me. And if it's there, Lord, we repent of it. We ask that you would cleanse us of these stones. You cleanse us of these issues because if they're not, they're going to end up in your kids and in the grandkids. Cut off those generational curses. Just let the blessings pass on. Amen. And so God is good. Let's stand and we're going to pray. Hopefully that was helped you guys. Amen. Well, Father, I thank you, Lord, for this revelation, God. Lord, that you're going to help us by your spirit. Because this, you're speaking to every heart. And this is a prophetic message, God. And you're, you're pinpointing different areas in our hearts. And we're all at different places. But it's not by strength and it's not by might, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, that by the spirit of God, we're going to be led into the place we have to be in repentance. In Jesus' name, amen.